dear guests, please welcome to the event. Have your comfortable seats. Thank you. So, dear Prime Minister, Secretary General, Ambassadors, guests, welcome to the International Conference on Inclusive Society from the Child's Perspective. My name is Angelica Rustikiana, and together with me is Manta Switches. We'll be co-hosting this event and accompanying you all for the two-day journey. Yes, indeed, an exciting journey awaits us, because for the first time, together with eight Baltic and Nordic countries, we gather live and virtually to open up the floor for the mutual dialogue on accumulated knowledge and good practices for strengthening children's well-being from a child's rights perspective. The main focus being on child inclusion, protection and welfare services, especially to the most vulnerable children. Here we gather every stakeholder, from the very young to the most mature and seasoned professionals in the field. It is our time to discuss good case scenarios and develop new solutions on how to make sure that everyone's needs are met. So today is the day when we co-design the future together. The themes of the conference will range from consequences of COVID-19 and children's rights to successful and effective cooperation models. During the conference, we have an excellent opportunity to meet and network with everyone, with the experts, with the practitioners, with the civil society representatives and youth themselves. As we here in Lithuania and hosted from this beautiful country and say hello to all the Baltic and Nordic region once again, I'm happy to share that back in 2019, three Lithuanian cities, Vilnius, Kaunas and Alitos, has committed to seek the child's friendly city status together. Implementing definitely their primary responsibility for the ensuring that children's rights are realized these municipalities will work with academia, private sector, civil society organizations, young people themselves to definitely create the best city environment they can. And the good news that the job has started already. A couple of weeks ago, here in Lithuania and across all our virtual, I would say, Baltic and Nordic region, we had a three-day hackathon together with the Nordic Council of Ministers, the Reach for Change organization, UNICEF, Catalyst Adventures, Junior Achievement in Lithuania. We accumulated over 60 young people across the nations and they were co-creating their best ideas and solutions to improve the state of the cities. And 16, guys, 16 prototypes were already created by these young creative brains. Really congratulations for this, probably not only the future generation, but the current generation, which we should be all proud of. And uh, definitely this, uh, I sometimes think Mantas is with me, he's so young together, <laughs> that uh, they're really change makers, aren't they? <laughs> and of course, this initiative was in collaboration with UNICEF-led movement, the Child Friendly Cities Initiative, which supports municipal governments in perceiving the rights of the children at the local level, using the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child as its foundation. So, dear guests, we welcome you to ask questions throughout this conference, live and online. You will see the QR code uh, depicted slido on, on the screen, so be sure to ask throughout the conference. So use your more in technologies nowadays, right? And you know, there is a saying, lead by example. So we also want to lead by example with this conference, accumulating all possible stakeholders once again, from the very young to the very experienced and the mutual, you know, together in the one whole. We also ensure that the simultaneous translation is there, that the sign language is there. Thank you for this opportunity for the organizers to make this happen. So, dear guests, dear Mantas, let's start and enjoy this wonderful journey together. together. Mm -hmm. Now, let us welcome the first speaker and the first greetings from Paula Lechtomeki, the Secretary General of the Nordic Council of Ministers. Thank you very much, Your Excellencies, 
dear participants, what could be more important than children? Their well-being and future. It is very inspiring that we are all gathered together today and we have an opportunity to focus on building inclusive societies for children. And I am very grateful for having this opportunity to make some opening remarks at this Nordic Baltic event. So thank you and warmly welcome to everyone. For the first, the topic of today is of course of extreme importance and I think also very inspiring. And we in the Nordic Council of Ministers, uh, we work in many different ways uh, with these issues. And one of the most important things, if not the most important, is actually uh, when we talk about building inclusive society from a child perspective, is actually listening to young people and children themselves. So the key idea of our work shall be that we shall ask themselves. We shall ask young people and children themselves. It is only through open dialogue with children and young people that we adults, we politicians, we the civil servants can learn whether our efforts have been successful or not so successful. And we also shall give real responsibility to children and young people themselves, because that is the only way to their real influence. The Nordic Council of Ministers has a clear target about children and young people taking own initiative, suggesting their own solutions to global and local problems. For many years, we as an organization have supported different kinds of targeted programs, lifting up a variety of great initiatives within culture, innovation and social cohesion. I would like to mention as an example one such program, namely Norden Zero to 30, where young people have shown examples of innovative, open and also brave approaches to regional cooperation. Within that program, we have seen how the Nordic network of future innovators has been born, how global warming is being explained by the new media, and how young people actually take the lead in breaking outdated norms and beliefs. So this kind of concrete work is actually very encouraging. We also support the inclusion of children and young people in decision making and in projects and processes that affect them directly or in other ways are relevant to them. And this we try to do by striving to having more and more young people represented in working groups or different expert groups or different reference group or other decision making processes. And I would like to uh, name a few processes as well. Uh, for example, young people are actively taking part in different civil society networks that are connected to the everyday uh, work of Nordic Council of Ministers. And last year, we also had a specific Nordic, Nordic Children's Forum for children in age group between 12 and 16 years old and that resulted in a Nordic children's resolution. But uh, dear friends, today, of course, it's time to look forward. And I think that today, today's gathering and today's conference is an excellent opportunity to learn from each other on the important topic of children's well-being from a child rights perspective. Today, we have the opportunity to seek inspiration from each other's successes and learn from them. Learn from successes, but also learn from what failed. I think we have good opportunities and strengths to develop our societies into places where children and young people can thrive, where children and young people can envision their future and where they can dream 
big. With these thoughts, I would once again wish you all successful discussions during the day and all the best success in this very important work. Children and young people are our future. They shall always be and have a very central role in our agenda. So I hope uh, that this inspiration drives your work and deliberations further on. Thank you. Thank, thank you to the Secretary General for such a warm welcome. It's truly open and so sincere when you can hear from a such a leader that we are open sometimes to break the norms, that it's fine to make mistakes. Truly, truly, thank you. Dear delegates, dear guests, I'm honored to welcome this important conference. Issues that will be discussed today remind us of many changes that have taken place in Lithuania over the last 30 years. Laws and economic systems have changed, but of course, the most important and difficult changes have to take place in people's hearts and minds. I grew up in a society where the child was expected to obey adult commands and where physical punishment was perceived as an effective form of education. There was no room for those who looked or behaved differently. I'm glad that we have been changing, but I'm also well aware of how much change is still needed to create a truly child-inclusive society, and most importantly, to involve children themselves in creative process and decision-making, to move away from the belief that we always know better and to start listening and acting together. Today, we are building a new generation in Lithuania, and it must be inclusive from a child's perspective. It must empower children in vulnerable situations, empower those who need to be supported, but first and foremost, to be seen and listened to. Thank you for holding this discussion in Lithuania, for helping us grow and develop empathy and for encouraging us to be a society where everyone matters. I wish you a thought-provoking and valuable discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And this is the time uh, and our honor to present the first speakers and the discussion participants and the first panel. Let us introduce you all to the youth panel, our minds and our futures. The panel will be moderated by a young role model already, the Umberto Massi, the board member of Lithuanian Youth Council. Umberto is well known for his active involvement in the youth non-governmental sector and his willingness to really pursue youth and other members of society engagement in civic activities, definitely in order to enact meaningful changes in our communities. Now, why is this panel important? Well, in these trying times, it has become increasingly clear that in order to have the chance to prosper and go as a person, we as a society must take care of our surroundings, both mental and physical. While in the non-governmental and civic sectors, this has become evident and clear, yet there is still some backlash from the public nowadays. So what can we do alongside other stakeholders in order to impact and shape an inclusive culture that provides a safe environment for children, young people, and adults to prosper? Let us find out. So, dear Umberto Messi, welcome on the stage. Please welcome your panel participants as well, and online and here physically. And dear guests, just to remind, here locally and virtually, you're welcome to ask the questions during the panel discussion so we can address them in the, during the session, right? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Just before I begin, I think it's quite difficult to follow those epithets and those compliments that have been given, so I'll try to make my best to actually fulfill that promise. I'm not sure if I will be able to, but we shall try. Um, excellencies, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, and those who are joining us at this conference from the comfort of their homes or their jobs, as now, as we have noticed, we have the chance to participate here both on-site and uh, hybrid move. On online. 
According to the father of conservatism, Edmund Burke, society is a contract and a pact between those that were, those that are, and those that are yet still to be. Most of the time, however, as mentioned previously, even in the past few days we could have seen at COP26 that even though the youth and the future generations have a chance to say something, not always are they heard out. Now we have the chance to actually hear the youth, so I'm actually very happy that we can do that. I will present now the first speakers who are present here on site. Now, I will invite Raseka Tinaite, who is a psychologist and a representative of the Tolerant Youth Association, to join me on stage. I will invite Emilis Mikulskis, who is the International and Policy Officer Coordinator of the Lithuanian School Students Union. You can take your seats. And also, we have three participants joining us online. Uh, uh, we, we won't have, uh, as I believe, two participants out of the three. So, just to... Well, everyone is here, actually. Okay, hey. just then everything is fine <laughs> and let's get the show on the road. Great, then. I will shortly pr uh, try to introduce them. Hello, colleagues. I hope you can hear me well. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Here from Vilnius, we have also Aveli Helatuli joining us. She's a school student from Estonia representing the Youth Council of Estonian Union uh, of Child Welfare. We have Emma Turki from Denmark, who is the youth delegate to the United Nations for Denmark. Uh, and also we have Julian Lokurlo, who is a youth activist and uh, a member of the Sustainable Development uh, Expert Group at the Nordic Council of Ministers. Welcome, dear colleagues who are joining us through the wonderful medium of the internet and here, colleagues who are here. Now then, we shall begin with our first question, which is indeed the primary idea in general of this conference, I believe. So this question will be addressed to all of the speakers of the panel. And I would really like to hear your thoughts and your opinions on what, in your view, personal objective, objective from your personal spheres of expertise, what constitutes a good and meaningful environment for a child, for a young person to thrive and to create something later on in their lives? Uh, is there only one model, one set of rules that can lead to a good environment? Or is it, is it more a way that it is not defined by one path? Can we do that in different ways too? So this will be the question for now, and I'll ask uh, Aveli to begin, if possible. Right, hello, and thank you. And uh, so to answer this question, then uh, I think the most important part is probably support, which is something young people all need. And uh, the support towards their dreams and ideas in general, it, uh, it should, they should not be shut down, but rather critique or just support it, uh, which is very important because really dreams are our future. And if young people don't have their dreams and they don't have their future, and at one point, then humanity doesn't really have a future. So also it's important that we uh, show their, them risks and responsibilities that come with life. We should not overprotect our youth. It is a danger, and uh, it is a pretty big danger, I would say. And uh, we should pay mind to that, that we show them reasonable risks. We don't overprotect them. It is uh, necessary to show young people that they are capable and they can do these things. But as always, things should be balanced. So we also should teach them that authors are just as capable and that they are not the only ones that are capable so they do not become arrogant there are like many ways that we can uh, that we can like achieve these things there is not only one way and it's really there are so many factors out there that will like influence it so i won't say it is like 
a certain way that we can do it. There are a ton of ways and a ton of factors. Right, thank you. Rasa, what would you say in regards to my first question? Okay, thank you. So, um, I actually agree with Evely a lot. I think that uh, the most important thing uh, when we're talking about uh, empowering is uh, safe space and safe space uh, everywhere where the, where the youth goes. Um, mostly maybe uh, in family and in school setting because those uh, are the places that they spend the uh, most time. And uh, when I talk about uh, safe space, I don't I do not talk about like um, discrimination free zone because I think that's bare minimum that we need to uh, achieve. But I'm, I'm talking about a, a bit more. I'm talking about empowering students, and I think that it's important to help them understand that the that they should feel free to express themselves to uh, figure out who they are uh, everywhere. And I think that starts with just helping them to understand that there is no right or wrong place to do something. And the school is not only about uh, uh, studying, as it's usually being seen, at least here in Lithuania, but it's also a place for them to improve their social skills, to express themselves and understand what they are getting. Uh, from the responses, how other people react to them. So I think the most important uh, place is to help them get the positive reaction to wherever they do, and uh, also uh, constructive criticism if it's necessary, but it still should be empowering. And uh, we should believe that youth are capable to decide what's best for them. We should include them to the decision process, decision-making process. And uh, I think that's the As far as I hear, these two main thoughts are present. So creating an inclusive environment, an environment which is not condescending, which is encouraging a young person both from these two answers. So quite some food for thought for the future. Only, only two speakers spoke. So let's see now perhaps what our colleagues from uh, Denmark have to say. Uh, you, Julian, I'll ask you if, if you can. Definitely. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Yes, um, indeed. And first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's great to, to be here, even if it's behind a screen. I'm, I'm happy to be together with all of you. It definitely would take a long time to name all the things that, that are necessary for ensuring the, the well-being of young people. And it's also true that the young people have different needs because young people are different. And usually one size fits all solutions are not the best ones. But there are some universal things that we can do that would help most uh, young people with their well-being at short but also long term. Real and ambitious climate and biodiversity action is something that is highly important. Uh, it might seem not something important in the short term, but it's actually the long term very important because it's actually our generation, young people that will pay the price of the lack of action today. So putting real emphasis on this is very, is very important to ensure the long term well-being of, of young people. Fighting youth unemployment and precarious work conditions is also, it's almost a universal issue in in many countries, including the, the Nordic countries and the Baltic countries. And everyone would actually benefit from policies that would ensure that more young people can actually find jobs and the jobs that they find are actually have some fair and decent uh, work conditions. As well, tackling questions regarding digitalization and, rounds uh, and, and rights around it, it's also very important. Matters such as digital privacy, data protection, digital education, artificial intelligence, etc they have a big impact on our societies and they will have an even bigger impact uh, as long as our societies become more digital. It's true that we actually don't have a lot of knowledge on this and there is something that, that we need to increase uh, the knowledge to ensure, to see how actually these things affect our well-being. More, we need to see how uh, digitalization affects young people's well-being and we need to make policies that actually ensure that the the day of tomorrow, people can coexist in a way that makes sense with these new technologies and in a way that doesn't harm them. 
And overall, there are many other things, uh, for example, psychological support and pre prevention, gender equality, sexual and reproductive rights, access to education, access to housing, etc. But because there are so many universal things and there are so many old, some less universal things that need to be implemented at local context, so a, a solution that tends to work really well is to meaningfully engage young people in decision making. Um, this could be through including them in democratic institutions such as parliament or, or municipalities, involving them in youth-led organizations, in, in, in boards of companies and organizations, etc. Because that is what actually will ensure that the things that really matter for young people are put in the center of the agenda and that we can actually follow up on that. I think this last thing was something that was mentioned by many speakers and is something that I strongly uh, support. Quite a range of meaningful things that could be done for me personally. I think something that mustn't be forgotten is the current climate on social media. We need to learn more about that indeed because young people spend much, much, much more time on the internet than basically the other part of the population, I would say. Our lives are ingrained in social media, but social media itself has some dangerous tendencies with polarization, with the algorithms that close us in our bubbles. I think that is also a very important task to tackle. Uh, I would like to ask Emma now for her insight. Thank you, and also thank you for inviting me. Well, so far, everything that I've been said that's been said, I absolutely agree with. And meaningful engagement is so important to be able to actually motivate youth to participate in the democracy, to uh, motivate youth to participate in society, and of course, climate and biodiversity and making ambitious politics on this. But since that's already been talked about, I would like to talk about exactly what you just started to say there, because I think that is one of the biggest issues we're having right now for youth well-being, but also for actually encouraging youth to participate. Right now, we see such a very, very harmful and aggressive atmosphere in the public debate, especially on social media. And I know lots of young women activists and activists of other backgrounds in Denmark who, when they start speaking out in public, are harassed by horrible comments. They get a very, very harsh negative feedback. And if we want the youth to be engaged and be able to try to actually influence their future, it should also be a safe space to actually participate in. And I think it's a huge issue that we really have to talk about because communication is absolutely essential if we want the different generations to speak to each other so we can solve all the different issues we're facing right now and have a more sustainable future. I think we really have to look at how we communicate with each other, both across generations, across uh, country boundaries, and especially on social media, because it plays such a humongous role in our society right now. And then to say something very uh, lastly about climate, which since Julian already said something, we have to think about that also over the world, we're very lucky in the part of the world that we live in, that climate will affect us, but maybe not as much as other countries. And the Malala Foundation actually has a uh, estimated that this year alone, 4 million girls will not finish their education because of climate change and how it affects their area. So having an efficient climate um, policy and politics is absolutely essential to be able to secure that the youth and the children of the world will have a better future and their well-being as well. Indeed, while some of these issues are quite jarring and quite us to tackle, especially from a youth perspective, uh, from my side especially, I think it's very strange and very interesting how on social media there is so much hate, so much vitriol against each other. I doubt that in real interactions people speak like that, that you would go on the street and insult someone because of how they wish to express themselves about their political views. So it's quite an interesting thing and indeed with the climate crisis looming above our heads, it seems that sometimes we may lose hope, but this is exactly why it is important for us, for young people, for the others to engage, is to change something and at least try to change something. Emilis, what would you say to round out the first uh, phase of this discussion? Well, first, 
first of all, I'm very thankful to be invited and joining my colleagues uh, in this discu discussion. Most of the stuff has been already laid out. I would like to add up that there's no one way uh, to help children or help young people, but there are some basics and some fundamentals. Everything starts in their family environment and in schools. You can create as many uh, opportunities outside the school, but not most of the students or school students or pupils know about that because most of the information travels in schools. So we should mostly concentrate in schools and empower students in schools, in universities, and in all public places that we can because that creates the biggest effect uh, on students' mental health because it has been proven by some Lithuanian studies that empowerment and showing young people that their opinion is important, that we actually care about what you're saying and about your is issues, improves their uh, emotional health mostly. So to summarize, I think uh, the most important thing is empowerment and believing in young people, especially in pub public places from young ages. Indeed, because we do not use, we, we cannot choose where we are born, in which conditions, in which families, well, we are. But those public places where we all, or most of us, have the chance to go, I think that's something else that is quite important, is to uh, create a system in general where all of the young people who are willing to participate or who are willing to learn could go to these places, to schools. Because as Emma said previously, we are quite lucky, uh, all of us mostly, with uh, having education, having the means to participate and to actually be on this stage I do not think that uh, mo many people outside of uh, these areas can do this. And especially also in our countries, it's not that uh, simple that not all of the young people are so actively involved. So that is also a challenge. How do we reach those youngsters, those children, who perhaps are not interested in youth non-governmental organizations, in youth activism? So I think that this is also quite an important uh, task now, moving forward to the next stage of the discussion, I will be asking the participants individualized questions about their areas of expertise, and we will be building from the school level to a more global setting. So I'll see if this idea of mine will work correctly in practice. We'll begin with uh, Avali. So, uh, as a school student, in your view, what should be done better in the future as the schools, as we actually just recently, just a few moment, moments ago spoke about, is the first point of entry basically to knowledge and to the future of, uh, of, of children. So in your view, is everything all right now in the school systems? Or is there something that should be changed? And in the case and in the scenario that you would be uh, of the opinion that there are changes to be made, what are those changes? So, thank you again, and uh, I will just go right to the thing that I think I think our grades are the worst problem. We can hear you, it's fine. Great. So, uh, I, uh, the way that the grades are being given, uh, uh, the way that the grades are being given, or this this way, is like it's uh it's very very uh very narrow, and it's uh it's about very specific things, and the things that we uh that we like give the grades for. Maybe we should reconsider what we give them for. And uh, well, yeah, basically, what I think is that we should not measure how, I don't know, smart you are based on these very specific questions. We can't measure things in percentages in every, every area of our lives. And uh, it really isn't working. Like, we should like measure how much effort you put in. We should encourage young people to learn. We should show them that uh, we should like, they should like learn always and they should want to learn that learning is a lifelong process but right now the grades they're just really pulling the motivation down most of the time you're just learning to get this 
one very good grade because the moment that you go don't get the best grade you're not smart anymore and and all your future it's being built up on these grades it's being built up on your exams on your results on these you just sit down for this one hour whatever you take this exam for uh, in and uh, and this is what your the rest of your life is about like that's what you build it up on but all their years that you've been learning before what do these matter like nothing really in this moment it's just what you know it's not it's not about the very specific things that we, that we learn to get some grades so i think the system in which the grades are being given should be uh different we should uh, pay more uh, attention to your effort and what you know about the topic in general what you actually uh take with you from the school from uh, about this topic not only the very very specific sentences or the very very specific way that you say or do something to get the result because this should not be what school is about it should not be teaching you how exactly to get the result it should be about seeing you the world showing you uh, how the world is and uh, showing you how to see it and sh- uh, teaching you new things and teaching you how to learn this is not what what really is happening most of the time also i think if we measured the effort and the and uh, if we if we pay more attention to these things then uh, i think young ch- people would want to go to school more often and they would eventually get better results indeed something that is quite important and sometimes gets lost in the process of learning is that most of the time you're motivated to get a good result a good grade just to pass or to get uh, uh, to a better university or to let's say be valued better but that's not the goal of schools at least that's not what we think i think i i i share this view personally with what avelie said i i i guess that most of the panelists and perhaps members of the audience also share the same uh, let's say vision that something that is important is what you learn not if are you the best at memorizing or at repeating what is asked of you uh, emilis as you are uh, in your last years of school uh, what are your experiences what could you share about uh, what be- what could have been done better and perhaps you could also perhaps reflect on what avelie said as you are both in in the school systems for now even though in different countries uh, well first of all being in the last year of school is stressful but it should be like that because in other ways it would be like do i care even about my results uh, to talk about what emily just said I like that in Lithuania we are going to make some changes in the four or five year span uh, because we should be careful about our education system and how we change it. Uh, I think there is a lot of changes that should be made, mostly with teachers and their competence to teach children because touching on the mental health uh, perspective, uh, let's say if a teacher is very stressful and doesn't know how to control stress and that stress passes uh, to the students and also to the pupils. Uh, most of the stuff that should be fixed in our education system touches with preparation of t- teachers. So these are the main things that should be improved, and that's from my perspective. Because if we have motivated teachers, maybe young teachers, uh, also uh, older teachers that come from uh, youth organizations that have other stuff they are doing outside the school, they can mo- motivate students to actually participate in our s- state lives and actually to improve our country in many different ways, not only to study and try to memorize all, some things that you need in the exam. So from my perspective and my experience, the most important thing in our education system is not only the student, but also the person that teaches and prepares uh, our student for futures. All right, well, touching upon, because well, even though we have talked about the technical side of let's say the schooling system that and the grading now we are going closer towards i think one of the topics that are most at hand and most important for my generation and for um let's say for other people in schools uh 
Rasa, I would begin by following what Emily said about the teachers being those especially uh, who, in a sense, form and create the environment in which the students, the school students, uh, participate and uh, learn. First of all, do you think that in the current system there are enough incentives for the teachers to be able to, uh, let's say, and perhaps enough competences to react to the ever-changing, uh, let's say, perspectives of, of the young people, of the young generation, is mental health actually taken with a serious view? And if not, how can we as a society move towards a place where mental health is a given, we understand and cherish that, and our school systems and our teachers and everyone else in society is geared up to better understand each other because not only do the physical walls of the school matter, also what is in the heart matters too. Well, it's actually hard to say because um, I think that uh, mental health and especially uh, psychological problems and disorders is being uh, addressed in the schools more and more. and. But I think that it's not being done in the right way. So now we have uh, all the teachers, especially in the primary school, um, talking about uh, different kind of children. They are talking about uh, how we are all unique, we are all special, how there is a child with the autism, how there is a child with Down syndrome. So they are talking about that. But what is the issue that it, it creates the, the image that uh, we, majority, are the good ones and there is a few of them that are not so good ones and we need to treat them as equals, but I think that's outdated uh, opinion because in my opinion we need to uh, talk about that there is no right and uh, wrong way to, to be and uh, that we need to accept everyone and uh, we need to talk that people, especially kids, uh, comes uh, in a different uh, kinds. So we, you can't say that this person might need a little more help, yes, but uh, that doesn't mean that uh, you are better than the other. So it's very important to change the way we uh, look at special needs kids, let's say, uh, because uh, when they're being treated like a minority, like um, someone that is not right, um, they feel like uh, they're wrong, that there's something wrong with them, and their mental health is uh, at stake. So, uh, when we're talking about mental health, it's very important uh, to create a discrimination-free zone and uh, we can only do it if we uh, figure out how to uh, empower them, them strength, but not uh, uh, the weaknesses. Indeed, something that is also a miss is that when we are talking about these issues, I think it's not only how, not only that we talk about them, as you mentioned, but how we talk about them, how we frame problems that are perhaps in our current vocabulary, how we speak about these problems, because this echoes what has been said previously, not only uh, in social media do these, uh, say, discriminatory talks happen, it also may be an issue in schools, especially if we talk about people with individual needs, if we talk about the LGBTQI plus community, I think that is indeed something that needs to be done and needs to be changed. That we go and move from a, let's say, majority-minority approach, which perhaps already in itself creates a different perspective. 
it's already a dichotomy between someone who is there and well there are more of them so well and then there are who are less and that i think that inclusivity does not uh, let's say is not based on uh, if you are more or less it's just how it should be the environment should be inclusive in and of itself moving forward to more global troubles as we have slowly for a few minutes had a chance to talk about schools about mental health now the most popular and the most hot topic sorry for the pun is the climate crisis and while mental health of course is being talked and talked about more in our countries there are more uh, means employed to create a better environment for mental health there are troubles with the environment that we live in some people may not have their homes after 20 or 30 years or even earlier now we are seeing uh, the changes so uh, i will uh, i will begin to ask my question to julian about in general not only about climate change but about the sustainable development goals in general and i must sorry i must point out that even though you are in denmark i see uh, vilnius behind uh, you so there is a bit of Lithuania there, I had to mention it. I think that everyone had a chance to see that. So how do we make the sustainable development goals a part of our general discourse? And in general, how do we implement these changes and how do we implement them on time? Because COP26, as we saw, quite a lackluster and lukewarm uh, result, especially for the young people. I understand it's difficult to find compromise between a whole lot of countries, uh, different interests and different ways of living, but time is running out. So what can we do to implement these changes in our communities, at least by changing ourselves, if we cannot change the global system for now? Thank you for this very relevant question. And it is true I have Bill News on my back here on my right, and I have Barcelona on my left. And is because my girlfriend is from Vilnius and I'm from Barcelona and then we have it always here in Denmark so we have our homes a little bit closer um, but in, in regards to your question um, it's, it's definitely very relevant and I think um, something that we need to be very careful with is with the idea of saying that the sustainable development goals is something that we need to achieve ourselves as individuals and through individual action because SDGs were not created as a tool to guide individual action. They were actually, it's a set of commitment created by countries for countries to implement themselves. And most SDGs, actually, we cannot even do anything about it individually. Myself, I cannot do a lot for meeting SDG 7 on clean energy or SDG 9 on industry and innovation infrastructure. Those things I are very are very difficult to do anything solely as individuals. But it's true that some things can be done on individual level. For example, one can eat more plant-based, one could choose to fly less whenever possible. But the truth is that these things do not reach very far. People will keep flying as long as train tickets are so expensive. And people will keep eating meat as long as the food served in workplaces is not plant-based and so on. So in reality, over-focusing on individual action leads primarily to not achieving results, first of all, because if we focus, if we do not focus on the structures that lead people to live more unsustainably, we do not fix the root causes of the problems. And even if we might fix some little things, we will end up making other types of mistakes in, in a later point. But it also, there's other, other, other issues with over-focusing on individual aspects. It also makes people unhappy because it builds frustration and anxiety of seeing that living sustainably is extremely hard, if not impossible, in societies that are built in a quite unsustainable way. And thirdly, it, and I think this is the most important thing, that is it removes focus from those decision-making bodies that can actually make meaningful changes. So when we, we were seeing that there are actually some spaces where real changes can be made, but we do not focus on those and we only focus on what can we do ourselves we end up focusing on the micro level instead of focusing on the bigger, uh, more necessary level uh, of action. So what we can do as individuals is to work to bring back the focus of the sustainable development goals and climate action to the collective level. 
We need to shift focus from the individual level to the collective one, because this will ensure that, first of all, change is more effective because it will make sustainable options the easiest ones or even the only uh, available and not something that would just leave to every individual to find out on their own. But it would also allow that sustainability is something that we do it in a more systematized and in a fair way, where the ones that have more responsibility are the ones that as well take more responsibility for the change and the ones that have less wealth then take less. So my take on what to do individually is to talk a little bit less on what we can do as individuals, but talk a little bit more on how we can get collectively all together to demand real and systematic change and action, because that's the way where we actually have a chance to, uh, to live in a more sustainable future. Indeed, and that is something that especially is seen in some circles, let's say the discussion that we can't force change on a global scale, so let's start with ourselves. But as Julian correctly pointed out, we really can't, as individuals or as people, change how we travel, build new systems of uh, infrastructure. And I think that what we could do then, what has been also mentioned already, is actually to move and individually understand that we are collectively responsible for our environment and our future, and therefore move towards uh, doing something and changing, changing how we live in order to, well, have a planet which is thriving, not only for those, for, for us, but also for the youth to come. Now, uh, in general, re staying on and remaining on this topic, I would like to ask Emma, as you are now the uh, one of the youth delegate uh, to the United Nations from Denmark, I would also like to ask you in regards as have we seen with the compromises that we talked about at COP in general about the, the clash between idealism and pragmatism. Is it possible to reconcile the youth way of thinking that we should do the most that we can with the usual way how politics are, politics is the art of compromise indeed. So is it possible to find a sustainable solution to uh, working together and living in, a same in the same environment when sometimes different parts of our society basically divided upon generation or on point of views? Is it possible to reconcile idealism and pragmatism, especially in questions with re in regards to what Julian talked about? I think that you are muted, if I am not mistaken. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. You know, uh, I've just come home from CUP, so I'm still a teeny bit tired, to be honest. But that was a really long question. I'll do my best to try to answer it. I think there's many levels to this question. Um, I think, for one, um, there is a need for youth to both be engaged within the system and with on the other side of the system. So we both need people to be on the streets demanding, creating this huge pressure to make politicians and the government make other decisions. But we also need youth who are working from the inside. Like the way that I used to be an activist, I come from the Green Student Movement in Denmark, or I'm still an activist, but now I play a different role in that I am on, um, I'm a part of the Danish delegation. and. Through that, I can have another influence and make another difference. So both things are needed. But I think the question of compromise, yes, I do not believe that we will make a decision from one day to another that will change the world. Of course not. But we also really need to, we need to like have some politicians who have the courage to actually act because the decisions that are needed to be made for us to actually live sustainably and to have a world that doesn't go to 2.8 degrees in global warming is we need to make some drastic decisions. And that really needs some politicians who are not scared that it will, uh, who are not scared of if they will be voted into parliament again, who are not making all of these decisions because they're scared of the backlash that will come because there will come one. But someone needs to make these unpopular decisions if we want to live on an earth that will be fun to live on. Otherwise, it's going to be very, very intense. I heard someone say 1.5 degrees in global warming 
will be hard to live with. Two and 1.8 degrees in global warming is going to be really painful. And two degrees in global warming will be absolutely severe. So we really need to, within the next couple of years, start acting. And of course, compromise is a part of politics. But it's about time for us to start actually doing something because we're so many people screaming for change, both the global south, the youth, so many people. So something needs to happen and it needs to happen soon. Something indeed needs to happen soon. And in general, the whole of this discussion is especially, it followed one on one path and one path only about what we can actually do to encourage and enforce and change the systems in a way that they could be more inclusive, more equal, not leaving any single person behind, no matter their background, their, how they express themselves. And indeed, this is the responsibility. This is our responsibility, the responsibility of the youth, the responsibility of our societies to encourage these changes because they are not only done for our comfort. Yes, of course, it would be better to live in a better environment which is fit and good for us all. Who wouldn't do that, no? But we also have responsibility to those who cannot sit at the table and make the choices at the time. We must also, as I mentioned and quoted Burke previously, we should, and we, we the youth speakers, should remember that one day there will be another youth, there will be other young people that we'll be responsible for. So we should all work together to make our societies more inclusive and more fairer. I would like to thank Emilis, Rasa, Aveli, Emma and Julian who joined me here for these 45 minutes. I hope this discussion was thought-provoking, that perhaps you have new thoughts, new interesting perspectives. I thank you once again for the opportunity for the youth to sit at the table, well, on the stage and on the screen, but still sit at the table and have our say. And I wish you a pleasant and interesting conference. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you so much, speakers. It was a very informative discussion, and I couldn't agree more with uh, what uh, Umberto said at his last stage, that we have to work together. Because uh, child inclusivity, um, uh, climate change, uh, mental health issues, LGBT rights, et cetera, et cetera, are very ne needed for us to uh, discuss, talk about, and then take action. So bold, courageous, this is our future. Well, so let us move on with Mantas for the next stage. Yes. So shortly we will see a video uh, with uh, amazing children, inspiring children, uh, which has been conducted by the NGO Nandre. And Nandre is an NGO based in vulnerable area Schnipischkas at our capital, Lithuania, Vilnius, and will soon be celebrating its 24th anniversary. At Nandre, they provide daycare for small children and after school activities. Together with the Nordic partners, it has allowed them to create a unique methodology for gender equality integration in education, which has led and made them the pioneers of this field in Lithuania. Nandra is also happy to be available to offer services to migrants, refugees, families with many children, single mothers, and other families in need. Do we listen carefully to the smallest kids? Do we really follow their advice? The National Council for Children in Denmark organized the preschool panel to listen to the voice of the youngest in over than 100 nurseries. So let us share the video from one of them, Nendre. <laughs> Nu <laughs> 
Ай, Маса. Где ж ты меня надлал, я дорогал, я жить. Ай, Мякай, виси меня мили, как виси с моим дариносом, как мама он меня не рекер, как мама, как аж отикеля меня гроста. Аж, аж, он же, аж я его буду президента спасить, что ты все будет с собой лагать. Аж, ты, аж у тебя может посадить, как, как, как я тебе там до пингу можу дырку, как я тебе там до сада до куплайна, как я на церкву там, как я весла будем лаймингу. Pasižiūrėm tam gerą pasirinkimą, pavyzdžiui, jeigu būtų karas, geriau stardyti tuos užpolėjus, kad kiti žmonės galėtų ramiai savo bėgti ten, kur jiems būtų saugu. Aš, jeigu būčiau prezidentą, tai tada duočiau žaislų pinigų, ledų. Kad turėtų daug pinigų, kad turėtų valgyt, ką, daug draugų, kad mylėtų, kad nuvažiuotų į kokią parką, kad nuskristų kažkur tai. Jiems paskelbčiau, kad jiems duotų daug pinigų, kad Jie turėtų gerą namą, kad vaikų mamos nepyktų ant pačių vaikų. Kad jūs jau pykstysi savo tėčių mamą, aš būnu nelimus, kad jau minės mama paprašasi sakvarkį. Aš būnu nelaminga, kai mane ant tik kelia, kai nežaidžia, kai kažkur nevažiuoja, arba sėdė namuose. Kada man mama nieko, kada man mama užaudė apžiūrėti plančetį ir kras manis nieks. Ne, žaidžia, nebandrauja, skraudžia, dar kalės valia visi labai ne, žaidžia, jau dvi dienos. We really sometimes feel that, you know, the happiness is such an ultimate goal for so many people across the globe, and it's such a gift that they probably most sincere personalities across the globe can share with us. And there is some good news. Uh, we're going to have, uh, again, some time for ourselves uh, and communication. We asked kids about what happiness means to them, what they would do if they would have an opportunity to be the president. So we encourage you all together now to have additional five minutes break and share in between. And please go to this another person you haven't talked to the one before today and share what happiness means to you and what you would do if you would be the president and we'll come back shortly yeah, so fruitful discussions to you all
we just discussed with Mantas that actually being a part of this conference and even hosting it, it's such a relief because it's all about inclusive society. Even though if we sometimes feel the hands are shaking or our voice is breaking, we still feel inclusive with you guys. <laughs> so really, thank you for such a warm welcome for us. And let uh, us move to the first keynote speech together with Sigrun Donilstotter on the first 1,000 days of life. Yes, uh, Sigrun is a psychologist and project manager for mental health promotion at the Directorate of Health in Iceland. She has already led a three-year Nordic collaboration project, the first 1,000 days in the Nordic countries, which centers on promoting well-being in the earliest stages. So let's give a warm welcome to our speaker. And I remind you to ask questions via Slido. Thank you. It's very nice to be here with you, even though we are only uh, speaking through the internet. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to be able to say, uh, tell you a little bit about the, the Nordic project that we have been working on over the past few years. Um, the project is centered on the early years in life, uh, the pregnancy and the first two years after, after birth. Um, and we know that this period of life is extremely important for uh, everything that has to come uh, later on. The first months and years in children's lives um, very much um, dictate their future well-being because brain development during this stage of life is at its peak. There is no other time in life where brain development happens uh, more rapidly. Um, and this is the time where the foundation really is laid for neural pathways and brain regions that have to do with all of our future learning, language acquisition, emotional regulation and behavior. So this is a really critical uh, period in life. We also know that a child's ability to trust, to love, to feel compassion, to regulate their emotion, and to be able to form um, warm and positive, trusting relationships with others in the future. Uh, this ability is developed through close and intimate relationships with the child's parents and caregivers. Um, and this lays the foundation for good mental health throughout our entire lives because our ability to connect with others um, is really a critical ability for mental health. Um, so this is why we uh, centered this uh, Nordic collaborative project around the early years. Um, this is a project that was uh, launched by the Icelandic uh, ministers in relation to the Icelandic presidency and the Nordic uh, Council of Ministers in 2019. Um, and they wanted to look at how the Nordic countries are promoting mental health uh, during pregnancy, how they are supporting a healthy relationship between parents and children how well are they doing in identifying and responding to early risk factors? And what are we doing to uh, support the well-being of the very youngest children in preschool and daycare? So that was the mission of, of the project and to gather the, the knowledge that we have in the Nordic countries to be able to both uh, improve ourselves and hopefully um, share our knowledge with others. So we started in 2019, the first year of the project, with a very extensive situation analysis where all of the participating countries, which are Norway, Iceland, Finland, Denmark, and Sweden, um, gathered a large amount of information on these four areas. So they collected information from their prenatal systems, daycare systems, uh, child healthcare systems, etc., etc., to answer these questions. And uh, 
the second year of the project, which was last year when we were all hit with the COVID epidemic, unfortunately, um, which changed a little bit the course of the project. But during the second year, the aim was to review the scientific evidence behind the interventions and the assessment um, tools that we are using in the Nordic countries to both screen for risk factors, to evaluate the de development, to um, offer interventions for all kinds of like interventions for parent-child relationship difficulties um, and things like that. And then the last year of the project uh, is where we, where we sort of uh, combine all this knowledge that we have collected throughout the project and form policy recommendations on what we need to do to move forward, to uh, make sure that we are doing everything that we can to support children's um, best possible start in life. But because of COVID, um, we have all gotten a little bit delayed in the, in the process. So the, the project should be ending this year, but in fact, it will stretch into, into the next year with the final con conference scheduled for 2022. Our partners in this uh, project is uh, the Directorate of Health in Iceland is leading the project. And then we are working with the Helse Directoratet and Erpu Östersör in Norway, the Itla Children's Foundation and THL in Finland, uh, Sunna Styrelsen in Denmark and Folkhalsamyndigheten in Sweden. All of these countries also have national consulting groups where we have national experts that we consult with and, and uh, discuss things that relate to the project. Um, and then also there is a Nordic reference group, where, which is a, sort of um, like uh, a representative group that is supposed to sort of keep track of the project and support uh, the project and its later implementation. Um, and there we have representatives from all of the Nordic countries as well as Greenland and the Faroe Islands. So in the situation analysis that we performed in 2019, we discovered a lot of strengths within the Nordic countries when it comes to supporting um, children's well-being in the early stages of life. For example, the Nordic countries are all uh, welfare states with strong infrastructure for uh, providing services to citizens. The services are in general free of charge. They are accessible to everybody. Um, there is a lot of participation. Almost everybody goes, for example, to prenatal care, um, child health care after birth and, and things like that. Uh, and also a huge uh, participation in the daycare and preschool system later on. Um, we also offer, um, there is an emphasis, emphasis on individualized services. So an emphasis on performing um, or on forming personal relationships with pregnant women and parents, um, offering extended and more frequent visits for vulnerable groups and things like that. Um, and a strong emphasis on supporting mental health and emotional bonding between parents and infants. So this is a very strong component of the services. Um, there is also a growing emphasis on screening for early risk factors uh, among expectant and new parents. And all of the Nordic countries also offer substantial parental leave. So um, there's a minimum of one year uh, parental leave um, and some countries also offer uh, more than that. However, we also found uh, several weaknesses that uh, we think that uh, the Nordic countries are not doing as well as they could be doing when it comes to supporting well-being in the early stages of life. For example, we found in our situation analysis that there are often problems with our uh, health information recording systems and our quality control systems, so they are not <laughs> operating uh, as frequently or as rigorously as we would like them to, um, and it is not 
secure enough that we are always registering all the inf uh, necessary information into the into the systems. <clears throat> There's also a problem with um, sometimes we are not using uh, evidence-based methods um, and supporting professional development in in prenatal care, in child health care, in early childhood education and care. So we need to do better in making sure that the staff is properly trained and they are applying uh, best methods, uh, practices that we know that are evidence-based. Also, there is a problem sometimes with the screening and the coordinated response to early, early risk factors. So uh, we are not always using reliable and valid instruments to screen for risk factors. And the main focus is often on the mother. So, of course, the child is usually raised by more people than just the mother. Um, there is the, the, the father or, or a different... Uh, or another parent, and sometimes even when the parents are separated, um, the mother will have a spouse and the father will also have a spouse. Um, so when we are only focusing on screening for risk factors in the mother, we only see a part of the picture. Um, we also found that there is an e uneven access to various services. So, uh, for example, the municipality size is a big factor here in areas that are more uh, smaller municipalities, more rural, for example, they have, they have uh, less extensive services, less specialized services, um, and the autonomy of service providers can also be problematic in this area because the, they have um, very much independence in what kind of interventions they choose to offer they don't even have to make sure that they are evidence-based or that they are based on good practices they have uh, complete autonomy in choosing whatever they like um, we also found that there is a lot of uh, difficulty in accessing information in the in the countries because they have of course these are countries where with millions of inhabitants uh, except for iceland um, and so their services are provided within municipalities and regions um, and they may not have the information about how things are working in general on a national level. So that made it very difficult for us to say this is how it's done in Finland or this is how it's done in Norway because it really depends on what area of Finland or Norway we are talking about. Um, we found that there is a lack of early intervention, so we are too much focused on what we need to do when things have gone really wrong, instead of meeting the needs of families and children very early, before, before things have progressed to a difficult place. And there are also weaknesses in cross-sectoral collaboration, so how our different systems are working together, for example, the healthcare system and the social service system that they are really integrated and working well together. There was a problem in that. When it comes to early childhood education and care, we also found several weaknesses. For example, there is um, a very common complaint that the, there is a lack of professionally trained staff. In all of the countries, we found that the salaries for people working in early childhood education and care are usually below the national average. Um, there are high stress levels, <clears throat> large group sizes of children, housing sometimes not suitable for, for childhood education, and there is a consistent lack of funding and resources. We also found that uh, all of the countries except for Iceland have a legal right for children to enter uh, preschool or daycare. But our partners were not really sure if this was a good or a bad thing because uh, of course it's good that a child has the right to be in in preschool or daycare but if we are not supporting the system with enough resources then we can find ourselves in situations where 
for example, a daycare center is legally obligated to accept a child into its, uh, its system, even if they don't have enough room uh, in, the, in, the, in the center, or even if they don't have enough staff to, to add more children. So uh, that can be a disadvantage if we are not supporting the system uh, well enough. So all of these uh, results from the situation analysis have been published in a, in a very extensive, uh, I believe it's around 200 page report that is available online. And I just encourage you, if you are interested in learning more about how things are working in the Nordic countries, what we found in terms of strengths and weaknesses and what we propose as a, as a way forward, to look into this report, we don't have more time to, to go into more detail here today, but I really encourage you to read the report and, and to use what you find useful in it. We have also uh, published uh, last year a report on the uh, evaluation of the scientific base be to, behind the interventions and the uh, Evaluate, evaluative methods that we are using to uh, to assess and to respond to any kind of uh, risk or difficulties uh, among parents and children, youngest children. Um, and that has been published in, in this report, the Psychosocial Interventions and Psychological Tests, a review of the evidence. And this report is also available online. Um, in the evaluation of scientific evidence, we had uh, the collaboration of two research teams at the Regional Center for Child and Youth Mental Health and Child Welfare in the University of Tromsø in Norway uh, and the ITLA Foundation, ITLA Children's Foundation in Finland. Um, the editors for this work were Monica Martinusen and Mario Kurki. And the results in general, they showed that uh, of the 63 psychosocial interventions that were assessed in this report, we found that the large majority, the, the, the very high majority, uh, was supported, rather weakly supported by any kind of scientific evidence. So level one and two, um, they refer to uh, a level of, of scientific evidence that is not, not very good, that's not very, very strong. And yes, as you can see there, um, around 86% of the interventions were actually uh, categorized in, this, in these, cat in these uh, areas. Only 3% of the interventions uh, actually achieved the highest level of evidence. When it came to psychological tests that were identified in the Nordic countries, um, things were a little bit better, but not, not too much. So as you can see here, um, about three fourths uh, of the psychological tests were only evaluated at level one and two um, and 12% reach the highest level of evidence. So this is also very interesting to look at in the report to, to, to see what, what programs, what um, evaluated methods we are using and how well they, they uh, seem to be supported by evidence. So in conclusion on this, uh, in this report, a large number of the interventions and tests that are available for the target group, meaning children from birth to two years old and their parents, uh, including pregnancy. Um, we have a large number of interventions and tests available, but the evidence on their effectiveness or psychometric properties is often lacking or insufficient. Um, and so it's very important and it's a part of how we can move forward and strengthen the way that we are supporting well-being in the early years in the Nordic countries is to enhance research efforts 
to, to strengthen the evidence base of the interventions that we are using, um, which are, of course, what our practitioners rely upon in order to properly assess um, and support mental well-being for children and families during this critical period in life. The next steps of the project is to uh, develop policy recommendations on how to best support healthy emotional development in early life to ensure that all of the children uh, in the Nordic countries receive the best possible start in life. And this is work that has already started. Uh, we are looking over all of the information and evidence that we have gathered over the past two years and trying to uh, put together messages for the Nordic governments on what we would recommend for them to do in order to, um, to provide better support for a, uh, a good start in life. We are also planning a final conference for the project. Um, right now it's scheduled for June 27th, 20, 2022. Uh, we have had to reschedule, uh, as you probably uh, have become familiar with yourselves because of COVID, but we are really hoping that uh, this will be our final uh, date. So keep that in mind and hopefully we will soon start to send out um, save the date flyers for that. So that is it for me. Um, I welcome any um, questions or, or uh, comments on this. Uh, so let us come back to Dia Sigrun. Thank you so much. Uh, and I hope you can see us properly, right? It feels like 1,000 uh, advices <laughs> on the 1,000 <laughs> days, right? Um, really, yeah. really thank you for such an inspiration. And we have a couple of questions for you, yes. and Mantas will move on. Yeah, uh, so we have a question from the audience uh, talked about how does earmarked uh, parental leave for fathers benefit the child's well-being? Um, yes, that is um, something that... <clears throat> I am mostly familiar with when it comes to the Icelandic situation. And here we have had um, a big emphasis on making sure that the system is set up so that both the mother and the father will take parental leave. And that is because the child is usually raised by both its uh, mother and father, or if there are two mothers or two, two fathers, or how, however the family is put together. And so it's really important that the child um, forms an emotional bond with both parents. And this also has to do with the general notion that being a parent is a shared responsibility. So if we move into the, um, if we welcome the child into the world and we start right away by saying this is mostly the mother's responsibility, then the message to the father is that uh, you are not important when it comes to the child's well-being and um, also that we normalize the idea that women should bear much more responsibility and, and a larger workload when it comes to uh, caring for the family. And we know that that's also a very stressful thing for women when they are working and they are still also expected to to be sort of the main care provider for the entire family so we believe that it's better for everybody to have a balance in this area but we also have to to make sure that the for example the child is able to um be breastfed and to to for the mother to really uh, be able to recover from from the birth and the breastfeeding we know that it is the mother who carries the child so uh, she obviously needs more time um, and support to to recover so we want to 
consider all of these and the way that we the way that we have sort of believed the best way to go forward is to just provide ample time for everybody so so that both the mother and the father can can have enough time with the baby and for their own recovery so thank you so much Sigrun for the wonderful talk answering the question and we uh, made you a good day and thank you thank you so much for your insights and yeah thank wow <laughs> so many so many thoughts and insights And you know what, Angelica, I already feel a community feeling and the bonding happened with all of the <laughs> participants uh, right here live and we will surely be transmitting that energy online. So, uh, but even more awaits us and uh, we'll, we'll talk even more. So we will be moving now into the parallel sessions where we will have the opportunity to discuss on these topics, empowering children in vulnerable situations, which will be held in the main room here and the child-friendly governance, which will be held in the room just on the left, the so-called smaller room. So before we dive into the parallel sessions, we still would like to greet you with a 10 minutes break in the lobby outside and see even on the first floor, you could probably have noticed some exhibition on sustainable cities. So, dear all participants online, we have also a special treat for you. We invite you for a break and an online exhibition, as well as Nordic quiz, which allows you to test your knowledge of the Nordic countries. So, the link of the quiz is in your inbox in the participation reminder email. So, dear guests, uh, have a lovely break and see you in 10 minutes, so which means like 15 after 3 p.m. back in the parallel sessions. See you soon. Thank you. Yeah. So, the parallel session is called Empowering Children in Vulnerable Situations. So uh, the panel will focus on uh, vulnerable situations specifically. And without further ado, let me introduce you to our today's wonderful discussion moderator, Tuve Schellende. Tuve is an international children's rights consultant with a passion for child participation. She has, has a background as a political scientist in the civil society movement and is now an independent speaker moderator and facilitator working for mainly public authorities and municipalities in Sweden. Tuve, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I would like to start by just saying thank you for the opportunity of being here and moderating this session on empowering children in vulnerable situations. And I dare tell you that we have a group of panelists here that will provide you all with both uh, concrete advice on how to empower children in vulnerable situations, but also provide some food for thought that we have had a couple of speakers talking about already. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our panelists. With us uh, here, uh, on uh, on stage, we have Aiga Apse. Please take your seat. Welcome. Aiga is a senior social worker. Yes, thank you. For SOS Children's Villages in Latvia. Welcome. Thank you. And we also have two participants with us online. So I would like you all to welcome our panelists. That it's Leah Barkadle, uh, who is an ambassador and a board member from the Swedish organization Knas Hemma. Leah, warm welcome to this panel. And I would also like to say a warm welcome to Anna Tilly, who comes from the organization. She's, she's a senior social worker from, uh, sorry, a senior advisor from the Central Junior for. for Central Union for Child Welfare in Finland. Welcome, Anna. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So with this panel, 
We will look at the role of civil society when it comes to empowering vulnerable children. And we will start by giving the panelists the opportunity of presenting their work and their organizations. And after that, we will follow with the panel discussion. So I would like to ask Leah to start uh, with your presentation, please. Hello. I uh, just want to say thank you so much for inviting us here. It's uh, a pleasure. And uh, yeah, so as you heard, my name is Leah and I'm 24 years old. I've been working with Knas Hemma for approximately four years now as an ambassador and a board member. Um, I have personal experience of the social service system as I was placed in foster care when I was around 16 years old. Um, today I am studying a relatively new profession called the teacher's assistant, focusing on the care of the students outside of the classroom. So, Knas Hemma, Young People's Perspective on Foster Care, is a national nonprofit organization driven by young people. The purpose of our organization is to strengthen the youth's voices and encourage them to be active participants, as well as educating them and increasing awareness on their fundamental rights within the social services and foster care. And our organization is composed of young people from the ages of 13 to 30. From uh, ages of 13 to 30. And this is to maintain our core value, which is an organization founded by the youth, driven by the youth, and for the youth. And you can participate in our organization in many ways. We have a focus group where we share our insights, offer our voices, and state our concerns on matters that we are the experts on. Who better to portray the actual situation than us, the ones who lived it? Uh, I'll be reading now a few quotes of things we hear from different individuals we meet. My family was well known as the dangerous family. And everybody knew that we kids didn't have it good. Still, nobody did anything. I was in touch with the healthcare department before I was placed in foster care. All my symptoms were interpreted as different diagnoses. They did not ask me about my living situation. After the investigation started and they understood my situation, all those diagnoses were dropped. The first time somebody reported a concern on my well being, I was 10 years old. The police and the ambulances were often out of home. They were well known in the area. I was first placed in foster care at the age of 16. As soon as people hear that I'm a foster kid, they wonder what I did to get there. When I was 15, I was severely assaulted in school. It was right outside the entrance. The other children were in a circle surrounding me. No one made a police report, nor were, they, were there consequences of any sort. Beating kept on while they were telling me I was ugly and disgusting, that they would beat me up again if I kept on irritating them. When I was 15, I called the social services myself and wanted to be placed in foster care. I was denied and they called the home to my parents and told them everything I had said. You have a roof over your head. It couldn't really be that hard. When I went to seek medical care, they saw my symptoms as something that was all in my head. I felt like they thought I was an idiot because I was a foster kid. Turned out I had gallstones. No one had asked me about my health, nor have I ever had a checkup. My foster parents got divorced and I ended up living with my foster dad. We worked a lot, so we barely saw each other and no one kept an eye on me. My friends always wanted to stay at my place because there weren't any adults there, so we could do whatever we wanted. When I was put in psychiatric care, the area I lived in didn't have one for children, so I ended up in a place for the adults. It was not a good place for a child. I saw a lot of things I shouldn't have seen. So, this needs to end. This cannot repeat itself at the expense of another child's future. These institutions and these decisions need to be made on the best interest of the most vulnerable, the defenseless, the ones that this hurts the most. 
which is the children involved in. A bit more about our organization and what we do is to further enhance young people's voices and participation. We have initiated a leadership program um, where, you, where young adults between 18 and 30 years old with experience from community care, foster homes and institutions can become our ambassadors. And uh, here you can see a, a couple of pictures of some of us. And um, this program consists of uh, an education in leadership and children's rights. However, their most valuable asset is their first-hand experience and the knowledge they accumulated while being in the system. From the age of 18, you can also become a board member and through decision-making influence the organization as a whole. And the reason we set the age from 18 is due to the fact that many of us before turning that age tend to feel hostility and anger towards the system that has failed us, which is by all means justified an important phase in our lives. Nonetheless, that anger is not always fruitful. Uh, Knoss Hemma's organizational ethics rest on cooperation and hope. Hope to inspire change together with the social services, the government, and other organizations working towards bettering the lives of the kids in foster care. We hope to establish a good connection and grow together. You may also notice that we have quite a high no um, age limit, and that's because we know for a fact that with our baggage and life experience, we tend to take a longer time than what would constitute a normal rate. Therefore, we offer a chance to be able to join the organization until you turn 30. We all have different experiences and we share this knowledge with, together with each other and with others. A little bit more about the role of an ambassador and the role of an ambassador is a very fulfill, fulfilling role. It's encouraging and strengthening. In my experience, which is the same for all of us, as an ambassador, I have learned that I am capable, that I have a voice, and that my knowledge and my experiences are valuable. As an ambassador, we are role models. We meet other young adults and children in foster care through arranging workshops where we encourage them to speak up, share their stories, to listen, and to be there as a support. Meeting these Meeting these courageous, strong-willed, gentle, intelligent young adults and children, most of them still experiencing the same obstacles and hardships we are working towards bettering. And, and nevertheless, here they are, taking a step towards a change, a journey of turning that, the baggage we carry and pain into knowledge and power, through bettering the lives of other children in similar difficult situations alongside people who understand and relate without any judgment. It's this dynamic of giving support and love to these young adults and children and receiving it back and them giving it forward to others. That is the spirit of our organization. Knoss Hemma has been for the last three years working um, a project financed by the Swedish Inheritance Fund. This project has been run in collaboration with the Children's Welfare Project and it started in 2018 and concluded in 2021. In this project, we're developing a completely new educational program in children's rights together with and for the children and young adults in foster care. It will be made into print and spread to social services all around the country with Knoss Hemmelis ambassadors as educators. And in this project, we have also produced a website for the youth with information concerning their rights, as well as stories from others and their experience in different forms, such as in writing, pictures, videos, and audio and, and podcasts. Uh, we have arranged workshops in different parts of the country where we create and develop the material and content of the educational program together with the children and young adults. A little bit more about what we do is that we educate new members in children's rights through participation in the organization, educating social services, foster care, and foster parents through seminars and courses. We give advice and suggestions in reports and studies at conferences and in other collaborative projects. 
We're developing methods in ways to increase children and young adults' participation. And uh, most important, we, are, we work with being a voice for the children and young adults through listening to them and collecting their stories. So, so let me finish by phrasing Knaus Hemma's core message, which is to stop fixing us start loving us. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Elia. Uh, I, before we move on to the other, other panelists, I have a short question for you. Since uh, you talked about uh, you, coming from an organization, uh, organization consisting purely of young people with experience of uh, foster care or alternative care, can you tell me that motto of the organization, stop fixing us, start loving us, what does that mean to you? To me, it means that I am more than my issues, that helping me become the better version of myself, helping me in your ways, um, my come off to most of us, especially to me, as fixing me because I am the one who's wrong or at fault. But what we need is not being fixed, what we need is being loved for who we are. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we will hear more from you uh, later on in the panel discussion. Uh, now, I would like to turn to my uh, colleague on stage, actually here, uh, physically with us. Uh, I get very much welcome, and please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here and to join through all this conference, and let me introduce you a little bit about our program. So, my name is Zaiga, I'm a senior social worker, and I'm working in a family support center provided by SOS Children's Villages in Latvia. So almost five years ago, we, we created a program. We called it Body, Parinex. And the main idea behind this was, and is still, to create a program to cooperating with families and children when the children and teenager has the main role in all of process. Or we can say this in other words, we would like to be beside the youngsters in their amazing teenager time. Um, and we do this because by the law, uh, it's required for municipalities to create a supporting program for families with children um, and to, for preventive purposes to reduce the risk of children to become in illegal situations or in other vulnerable situations. So we made a program and we made such a, like a cooperating formula. And there are four main players, teenager, family, social worker, and a teenage support person. And teenage support person in this, uh, in this system, there, it can be a little bit friend for the teenager, a little bit mentor. It can be whatever it needed to be for the teenager. Of course, uh, very often the family needs ad additional support and we provided um, additional specialists, psychologists, addiction specialists, psychiatrics, uh, family therapists and the lawyers. And the good news about this is that all this support are available in one center. So the family and the teenagers don't have to go in a different places of Riga. It's all available here in one place and it's easier to achieve and it's easier for all of us to do the things together and put the, this little teenager or big teenager till 17 years old in a center. And uh, our experience showed us this working together is the key of solving the issues. When we started to working with our families, there is always some issues already with the teenager. Mostly it's uh, behavior problems. There's a bad relationships with members the, uh, in family. There are absence of school, um, even addictions. And it's all require 
to go to work together to solve the issues and we know that sometimes these issues that are shown it's only one of them and very often it's a result of other uh, struggling that teenage already meet and so we can solve this all together but only if we involve and put the teenager in center. We have to give them the message that we care, we are all together for them, not against them. We not judge them because he do something maybe bad, but we are here, we are open-minded and we are motivated to look behind the things that are obvious. Yes, teenager and the family has the issue, but I still hold the key for the solutions and only together we can do this. And that's why here the main role is for the teenage support person. He very often encouraged the teenager to speak, to ask or to make decisions. And um, to do this, uh, it's vital to create a trusting relationship. It's easy to say, but of course it's hard to do, especially if the teenager has already different kind of experiences in communication. What we really try to do and what we understood, it's possible when we base our communication on the trust, on respect, uh, we create safety and environment we, when we are and we are with the teenager. Uh, we are supporting them and we speak in one languages. Of course, in Riga and Latvia, we are working with the uh, Russian-speaking families and Latvian-speaking families. That's why um, our teenage support persons, they are with Russian and Latvian native language. So in basic, the communication is easier if you speak in one language. And there's a, during this all con cooperation with families, we are not focusing only on these difficulties. It's very important to find and develop some skills, some interests and strengths that teenagers have. There is always such a thing. We can find and they can find in every situation something that is good or that he wants to be better. Uh, sometimes they have my mind in their mind ideas that they want to try, but they are, they are scared. So we can be beside, the teenage support person can be beside to change, to, to experience new things. And there's a lot of way how we are doing this. Well, uh, we can meet with teenagers in person, and personally in individual meetings. It can be in a cozy cabinet in our office, could be at home. They can go out, they can do whatever they want in this meeting. Some, sometimes our teenage support persons, they are cycling, they are fishing even, they are going just to walk and talk. They eat dinner, like, like come and go to Hesburger or somebody, somewhere else, just to keep this contact, to find each other, uh, to get to know each other. Um, uh, teenage support persons can do this all stuff in the groups. They can organize uh, group activities for one purpose. For example, uh, they discuss some, some, some important questions for the teenagers, but sometimes they are just making, every Monday there has ability to come here and make a sport. Teenage support person will be at office at the Mondays at five o'clock, and it's a possibility to, 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 to gym. And of course, we're planning the outdoor activities and field trips. It's another uh, our, our field of work. And uh, when the teenage support persons are planning these outdoor activities, they, they keep in mind the interests, uh, the abilities, uh, and the speed and the time of all this. And they're mixing activities so they keep the balance between the intellectual and physical uh, activities so to get an attention. And of course, uh, if we are activities, we all are participating in this. So we are showing for teenagers that it's okay if you don't know something. We don't know either all. We don't have to be a perfect person for teenagers. We just have to be beside and to teach and to encourage. And that's the way how we are trying to do this. And the same with the field trips. Uh, we are planning the field trips, for example, every, sum, every summer, um, three-day camps for our teenagers, and we all participate in day. 
uh, we can we can plan one day trips for all of families. Sometimes, if during the co uh, cooperation we find some issues that we can uh, solve, for example, and it could be in a way we can just make a one day for one family and to create this activity for one kind of issues. And uh, the other part, and let me finish with that, it's the, we invite families to participate in traditions, to involve families to do the things together. They don't usually do this, and uh, we invite them. For example, we have the tradition before the Christmas, we invited all our families and we make a dinner for them. Now it's COVID, it's not possible, but we, but we made gift boxes and we put them uh, different kind of things. Um, well, we will think about this Christmas, but, for, but, um, but tomorrow is Latvian Independence Day. It's, it's a big day for Latvia. And we made the boxes for this fest too. Uh, even today, I think my colleagues finished visiting all our families. And just for example, we put them a recipe for the snacks that we can make, that they can make together and, uh, um, and those all supplies that is needed. We wrote the letter why this is so important day to the Latvia tomorrow. We um, didn't support persons, give them a little uh, clues uh, what can we what can they do during these holidays together we put them in a white um, table for for the dinner the candle um, the game I love Latvia they can play together and this sent for every member of family so they can feel the connection and this is how we try to invite them even if it's not possible to be together so that was a um, little introducer. Of course, it's a very uh, exciting and challenging at the same time to be with the youngsters in their journey in the teenage time where they learn so many aspects of adults' life. But uh, we all can be the body for somebody in this time. So me and my colleagues, you see how we all are here, are sending your greetings and encouraging to be the body for somebody. So thank you. Encouraging us all to be the body of someone. Uh, I think that's a very good encouragement and something that we can all bring uh, with us. Uh, before we move on to Anna, our last panelist, uh, I would just like to ask you, you talked about this helping the families of, uh, of implementing or starting uh, traditions, for example, by these boxes, which is a, a, a great uh, idea. Can you say something about why that is important? Why do you think it's important to sort of nudge into these traditions? Well, during on our cooperation with the families, um, this of almost five years, we understood that if um, the most of them has issues with the problematic relationships between each other, and they don't have traditions, they sometimes don't even eat together. They don't do lots of things together, and this is the way how we can encourage them to feel. They don't have to just sit and talk. They can be together if they do something else. It's implemented these relationships. It's a new experience how to just be in one place for a couple of minutes, maybe half an hour. And it's, it's working. It's working. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and we are all longing for starting the panel discussion, but before that, I think we are longing to hear Anna Tilly's presentation. So please, your 15 minutes, you're very welcome. Okay, so hello everyone, good afternoon. Hopefully you can see my presentation at the moment and hear me well. Uh, so my name is Anna Tiili. I am working as a senior advisor at Central Union for Child Welfare here in Finland and I'm happy to participate in this panel discussion and, and uh, share my thoughts about the support and empowerment of children and young people in alternative care. <clears throat> 
So to start with, uh, maybe just a few words about our organization. So uh, the Central Union for Child Welfare is a central organization uh, that works to promote child welfare. And we want to make sure that children's rights are implemented in full all over in the Finnish society. And the aim of the organization is to bring together municipalities and child uh, welfare NGOs. Uh, so basically, we work with our member organizations. And uh, just to clear, uh, we don't uh, provide services for, for child protection customers or we don't do direct uh, customer work. Um, then just some uh, basic facts about the child protection and alternative care system here in Finland. So uh, basically, uh, the Finnish child welfare system is based on the Nordic countries' idea of prevention. So the um, idea is to prevent situations not to get too bad and, and prevent the need for alternative care. And in Finland, we have a quite vast range of child and family care services. Uh, also, when a child is a customer of child protection, open care services are always provided at first hand. So alternative care is a last resort intervention. And the overall ideology in, in Finnish welfare system is that uh, we believe that people can change and improve their lifestyles. And that means that child protection placements are never permanent. Uh, it is actually written in the law that uh, the social worker uh, must work for the reunification of the family and the social worker must check the situation every year and check if it's possible to bring uh, the child back to his or her uh, biological family. Um, in Finland, we have two types of alternative care. We have family-based care and we do have institutional care. And family-based care is uh, divided into foster care and uh, small group homes. Um, family-based care is always uh, the priority number one when a child is taken into custody. It was added in the law about 10 years ago that family-based care should always be considered first when a child is taken into custody. So at the, mom at the moment, uh, the proportion of uh, family-based care has been growing constantly and more than 50% of the children living in alternative care are in family-based care. And also in the recent 10 or so years, uh, there has been a strong emphasis of, of taking into consideration the relatives and other close people of the child and finding out whether it is possible to place the child into his or her uh, natural network. Uh, then some concerns in the Finnish alternative care system. So uh, even though we do prioritize and develop uh, preventive family services in Finland, we need the need uh, for alternative care has been increasing. And at the moment, we have seen a concerning trend of teenage emergency placements uh, growing. Um, also, another concern is that um, the cooperation of different child and family services is insufficient. Um, 
I think it's crucial to understand that um, child protection services cannot help uh, the children in al alternative care alone. Uh, we need to improve the cooperation. We need the whole uh, family care services and the whole system to collaborate. Also, um, a concern is that, unfortunately, we know by research and by the monitoring of of the uh, ombudsman that alternative care in Finland has not always succeeded um, in ensuring that alternative care would be truly supportive and safe for the child. So unfortunately, some alternative care units and some foster care families have not always respected the rights of a child and some practices have been clearly against the law. So, so these are some of the concerns in, in the Finnish system at the moment and, and these are some of the reasons um, why I think it is important to constantly talk about the support and empowerment of children and young people in, in alternative care. Then something about our work what we have been doing to promote uh, the quality of alternative care. So uh, our organization has, has a long history of, of advocating for quality alternative care. Uh, the Central Union for Child Welfare has, for example, translated uh, the UN guidelines of alternative, alternative care in Finnish so that the municipalities and alternative care uh, units would have a shared vision of the quality of alternative care. We have also, for example, participated in the work of quality recommendations of, for Finnish child protection. And also we are relentlessly reminding in our statements uh, about the rights of a child. And then we also, for example, we arrange annually forums for experts by experience uh, together with other NGOs. And we have uh, published for example, uh, different kinds of guidebooks on how to uh, strengthen the participation of children in, in uh, alternative care and in child protection. Uh, then I was asked to present uh, some of the activity of experts by experience in, in Finland. So I would like to tell you something about this uh, group called the survivors. So this group is not working under our organization, but uh, it is a good example of the uh, activity uh, of experts by experience. So basically, uh, first steps in the activity of, of uh, experts by experience in child protection were taken in 2008. Uh, this uh, Finnish child protection NGO called Pesapu established a group for young people called uh, Survivors. And Survivors' aim is to bring together young people who want to make a change. And it offers an opportunity uh, to young people to discuss about the issues concerning child protection and look for solutions to make the system better. Uh, so survivors share their personal experiences to, to influence uh, service providers, uh, decision makers, policy makers and, and other interested parties. Today we can say that uh, survivors are a crucial actor in different kinds of forums uh, where child protection is being discussed and developed and the messages of the survivors are listened to in many arenas. 
uh, for example, in, in national and local child protection conferences and government programs and, and so on. Uh, survivors and other experts by experience have actively influenced uh, in, in legislative changes. Uh, their request for being met as a person by a social worker was realized in the Reform of Child Welfare Act, uh, which introduced a new paragraph stating that the social worker should meet the child in person often enough. Um, survivors have a clear space for other groups of experts by experience. And nowadays, um, experts by experience are valued more than before. And, and we can even say that participation of young people uh, with a background of child protection is, is almost taken as a self-evident thing here in Finland when, when we are developing services. And this is obviously a great thing. That was it. Uh, thank you for your attention and maybe we will start discussing together. Yes, we will. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, I think it's uh, there's so many different perspectives being brought up now. I would like to point out that what we have on stage, uh, there are three uh, experts from different kind of NGOs, but also that there are two organizations working with children in alternative care, foster care, and one organization working with children in vulnerable situations in more in general. So we will have those both those two perspectives with us as we speak. I would really like to start by giving you, the panelists, the opportunity to react to what you have heard the others uh, say. So, Leah, I would like to start with you. What, what's your react, reaction listening to, to the other organizations' presentations? It was uh, interesting. I, a lot of information <laughs> and it was fun to listen to. And I, I, it caught my attention with the, the first presentation where it felt so no pressure whatsoever. It was about enjoying company, being there with each other, connecting in a in a place where it didn't matter. There was no prestige, nothing, and and uh, it's uh, no. It was it was lovely. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. And Aiga, was this something in specific listening to the others that caught your attention or something that you... Uh, I get um, for all of us the main idea is not to judge and not to fix, but to understand and to love. I think that was in the first part of the uh, presentation and that is the idea what we are spreading with our body program too. And um, yeah, I think that was the main idea. And as, as soon as we make an interest and show the interest of doing make, and making things better, it's it will be better. I get this. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Anna, having listened to the other two, what were your main reactions or something that you, you bring with you from having heard the others? Well, Everything was very interesting and I definitely agree, for example, the fact that we need individual perspective when we are trying to help uh, children and young people. Uh, it was uh, extremely touching to, to hear the stories of, of uh, people with, uh, with the background of child protection and, and uh, uh, I, it seems that uh, Leah, uh, you are doing such a such an important work, and and I think that strengthening the voices of of youth is the most important thing we can do when we are developing the services. Uh, I really liked your slogan: "Stop fixing us and start loving us," and that is also something we hear 
in Finland uh, when when we hear the messages from experts by experience. Yes, and that is another another slogan almost or expression that I think many of us can bring with us. That expert by experience is something that can be used and uh, and spread into many different uh, many different themes. Uh, before we go into the part of talking about how to work with empowering young people in vulnerable situations, I would like to stay a little more in the essence of uh, your work. And Agatha, I would like to start with you. You talked a little bit about working together as a key factor for, for success. What other things do you think uh, there are in your work that makes it successful? Uh, the key of the successful is when we are, well, we don't, we are, we have to know our work and we all are experts in something. And sometimes it's not enough, you need more supporters. And if we know, and we look at this one teenager and we put in the first, so we can all do our best we can and to keep this idea that we are doing this because of these children, because of this teenager. It's not because of me, if somebody are asked to do, it's because it's necessary for him. And if we are doing together and with a teenager, is the key of solutions of issues. Yes, thank you. I think that's uh, I think that's very clear. And I'm going to send that same question over to you, Anna. Uh, if you look at the the key factors for success, and maybe also adding what can be done or maybe copied in a Nordic uh, Nordic Baltic uh, context from the work that you do. Uh, well, I think the one most important um, uh, key to success is uh, is that we see uh, we see the power in in the networks and in the collaboration of of NGOs and public sector. So so working together uh, is is something that is extremely important and. Our organization gathers all the um, actors and all the uh, services around the same table and and supports uh, the mutual discussion. So so I think uh, that is uh, the, the success factor. Uh, how can it be copied into into other contexts? Well, I suppose there already are different kinds of networks who are uh, working together and, and that is a good thing. Uh, I think a good collaboration of, of different actors uh, usually need one, one actor who, who coordinates uh, the cooperation. So, so that is probably something that is quite important. Thank you. I think this also can bring all our minds back to our previous keynote uh, speaker, uh, Sigrun Daniels Dottir from uh, from Iceland, talking about the importance of the uh, of the cross sectoral co collaboration, and that is a key to success and something that is not uh, well that has room for development, to put it. Uh, Leah, looking at the, the impact of Knaus Hemma, what would you say is the key to success in your case? And also maybe uh, what's the, the biggest need for, um, what's the best kind of support that you can get in order to reach that success? <coughs> well, I think the key or our motive or goal is to lift up every kid that feels that they are the one who's wrong, to give them a space where they can meet others and uh, help them realize that because they come from that past doesn't necessarily mean that they, that they have to, to be there as ambassadors and role models to show them that they are capable of getting out of that life and it's not it's not like a sentence. All the things that they've heard 
about themselves, uh, all these negative things that they live with, that they are not it, that there's so much more than that. And uh, what we need for that is, I guess, just the reach. We need to meet more, connect with more organizations and get our name out there and meet just as much people as possible. Um, yeah, spread um, what we know, what we need, what was that, what we needed to hear when we were there. Thank you. And Leah, I must ask you, I'm going to continue with you for a bit, because uh, we know that uh, working at the, the forefront uh, with issues, that, as all the organizations are doing in, in one sense, can lead to meeting different kinds of resistance, always when we want to achieve change, that can lead to meet resistance. And I'm, I'm curious, you're working with uh, with the actual empowerment of young people with the, with this experience that that you share and that you all share in your organization but what kind of resistance do you meet and how do you cope with that resistance well i mean i think it's mostly the structure of the the different governments um that is the resistance, like, and the fact that we are quite um, <clears throat> relatively small. And uh, I know that one of the hardest things for me was that, if, for example, one of these institutions that kids live in offer coming to see us as some sort of um, gift for being, for doing a good job. And uh, it's quite limiting in that sense that only the ones who do good can come and join our organization or even come to workshops with us or, um, but every single child is needs to know about their rights. It just shouldn't be as a gift for good behavior. And, um, so that's one of the things that we've noticed that they think that maybe one of these the kids that have it, the difficult kids um, shouldn't be presented and brought to us, which is quite the opposite. They are the ones who need it the most. Every single kid needs it the most. And um, well, the other resistance I think is the hardest one is that kids get to move around a lot. Um, so we're not sure that the socials, um, the, the, com the county that they live in is necessarily the one that they always stay in. So losing contact and um, it's also um, a difficult one. But um, so I think the best way that we work with this is to get our, our foot in there um, show that we want every single one of them kids and to spread our word and name and uh, make it as welcoming and open as possible for everybody to come and join. Thank you so much for sharing that insight, uh, Leah. And uh, Aiga, would like to turn to you as um, Leah mentioned what what can be called difficult kids or, or children with challenging behavior. Uh, we talked a little bit beforehand, the panel, about that it's sometimes easier to, to uh, for, for society in general to find the sympathy or empathy for maybe, uh, maybe younger children and maybe not as much for, for example, uh, teenagers with challenging behaviors. Is, is that a res resistance that you meet as well in your work? Yes. Of course, because, uh, well, our teenagers between 11 and 17, uh, they started program uh, latest 16, sometimes 17, because we have, we, we have right to work with teenagers only till the 18 years old in our program. So, uh, yes, sometimes when we are just try to make some resources and give opportunities to our teenagers to show the world, or for example, um, we will try, we have tried to find organizations or people who just, who are open and would, would like to just one day spend time with these teenagers to, to show how it is to be in her profession, for example, or how is to do 
one thing another. Uh, as far as we talking in society, there is understanding, yeah, they need it. But when we go forward, uh, like a step, next step, and, and I will ask you, are you available for that? Then sometimes it's, it's not. They are not open for this themselves. Is there, maybe they're afraid of something. I don't know. I think it's like some kind of trust issue. And uh, the other thing is that teenagers know that. And the most they can get the answer no, it's harder to him ask again. And that's the other issue that we are talking about. Yes, that, I think that's a really important point. Thank you so much for uh, for, for highlighting that. Uh, Anna, I'm also curious uh, from your perspective, uh, is there some example of resistance that you want to share with us? Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> to start with, I think it's important to say that uh, NGOs uh, job is to not not to give up so so uh, as I said our mission is is to promote uh, children's rights uh, we are trying to make sure that uh, children's rights are fulfilled in, in child protection and and we are uh, relentlessly uh, advocating for the quality of of alternative care and and I do feel like uh, most of the time uh, our message is is received uh, well, but uh, obviously sometimes there are different uh, opinions on on the quality, what is quality, um, and obviously uh, quality in alternative care doesn't always come without costs. So we need, for example, enough resources in child protection so that uh, the professionals would have uh, enough time to, to meet the children and, and hear their opinions. So, so sometimes uh, these things, um, they bring up uh, contradicting opinions. Uh, especially when when the issue is about the uh, resources of of child protection, so uh, we have both NGOs and municipalities in our member organization, and obviously it is important to hear uh, all the different kinds of messages. But as I said, our mission is always to promote uh, children's rights and and uh, bring up the quality of alternative care. So, but yeah, sure, surely there are sometimes uh, contradicting opinions. Thank you. I think we can all take that with us as well, that the role of the NGOs and, and for the society uh, working on fulfilling children's rights, our job is not to give up, but to continue to continue this work. And speaking of children's rights and the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, just to remind us all about what uh, Article 12 of the Convention said of every child's, each and every child's right to form an opinion uh, to express that opinion and to have that opinion given due weight in ev each and every uh, administrative uh, case concerning that child. My question to the panelists is how far away are we from that right now? Uh, Anna, you may start. Well, that is a good question. I'm sure we have done a lot of good job uh, in in the recent decades, obviously, uh, times have changed, and that is a good thing. But I think, unfortunately, we are still too far away from the ideal situation. Uh, we do see, as I said, uh, in the in the daily practices in in child protection, uh, that this principle of of participation. Uh, children's rights are are sometimes forgotten, 
and and uh, for example, social workers, uh, child protection units, foster care families. Sometimes they they forget this uh, main principle of of participation. Um, and in order to the right of of a child to really uh, realize, uh, we we need enough resources. So as I said, professionals must have time for the children. But also, it's not only about resources. Uh, we also need more awareness, uh, and and also kind of like. Uh, maybe a change of attitude. Uh, we need an attitude where the participation is highly valued, and and we we need to listen uh, the voices of of those who have experienced from from child protection, and we need to listen uh, the customers. So, to those who have experience, uh, Leah, what is your reflection to how far are we from the fulfillment of this uh, of this right? Yes, I, I agree with Anna on the fact that we we have come far, but we're not there, and uh, I feel like we're not we're not as far or we're not as close to it as we think as well. Um, especially when most of the kids that we meet don't really know about that the, the children's rights. I guess they assume that they that they know of its existence, but most of them don't know that it's actually something that concerns them as well, and uh, and what an impact and power it actually is. And um, it's always assumed that the, the the adults or the parent has the more rights, even nonetheless, even if I do. And um, some of uh, of these kids also think that, uh, for example, the right to food and nourishment and safety and uh, stability that that is con is actually only concerning children in Africa, for example, who don't have food, that it doesn't actually concern them. That's, that's when, therefore, when they don't receive any food in the housing that they live in or in the foster family that they live in, it doesn't go together. That right doesn't concern me. It concerns the children who are starving, but then they are the ones who are starving, but it doesn't make any sense. And also most of these kids have uh, carry a lot of trauma and many of them develop very low self-esteem and self-value. And uh, for them to be able to, to, to grab that book and, and, and tell them that they have the right to all these things, it doesn't make sense to them either. Because they feel like they're not worth it. They're not worth fighting for. They don't have a chance to have it better in any way and the way that they have it at the moment is just good enough it's at least better and therefore they don't strive for anything more and um, so i feel like as it really needs to get to the point that every child <laughs> um realizes that 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 they also have a power in a, in a family dynamic until this can become a norm that we don't have to talk to, for example, like if you take 20 different kids and ask them if they have rights, they don't need to think about it for a second. <laughs> like, And most of them are just looking at me, wondering what, what we're talking about instead. So until then, I feel like we're not there. So that sounds like we have some important work uh, ahead of us continuing to change those uh, to change those norms. We are wrapping up this uh, uh, panel full of wisdom with one last question that I would like to ask all three of you, and I will also last ask you all to keep it uh, short and to the point because now we have a great opportunity 
to give your best advice or key message to any uh, civil servant or NGO worker or policymaker out there uh, working with issues related to children in vulnerable life, life uh, situations. Aiga, you get to go first. What's your key met what is your key message? More listen and ask before they make decisions. That will be the main idea of all the support and the couldn't be more on the point. Anna, what is your key message? Well, maybe we have already heard this message from, from Leah, but I, I think that we must make sure that every child in alternative care feels like they have all the possibilities in the world and, and they have all the possibilities to, to become to their full potential and and to see the world full of possibilities. And uh, it is crucial that every child in alternative care knows their rights because uh, knowledge is power and it is the responsibility of the adults in alternative care to make sure that children know their rights. They, they truly understand what is going on and why, and they have uh, possibility to be heard and to say their opinion. Thank you very much. And Leah, you get the opportunity to end this panel with your uh, key message, please. Yes, I mean, I'm gonna repeat myself, <laughs> but no matter what, through any decision ever, ask the children involved. That's all. Uh, simple as that and something that I think we can all take with us. Thank you so much for your great participation. At today. So talking about uh, the leaving part and, uh, and what will you all take away from this uh, discussion will be left to you, but I have several questions from the audience. Well, one of which is, in what ways can we protect special needs children knowing that they face the most harm? And the question is to the whole panel, so whoever wants to answer, do. Uh, I think we send that question to Aiga. Mm -hmm. Well, but can you repeat, please, the question? Yes. In what ways can we protect special needs special. children knowing that they face the most harm? Yes. Well, in our program, we have no large experiences with the children needs, but it's still, I think, it's it's very important if we if we can uh, solve some issues and help this family, then we need to listen and ask for all of for, for members who knows the best and provide the, the, the services or the helps they need. And if it's not, they, we are always open to change something because the uh, um, su uh, supporters need to be uh, available for every children in need. So that's the thing. That's wonderful. Great answer. And uh, there is uh, another one that I would like to address also to the whole panel. It would be in what ways um, uh, can we um, uh, involve parents and also professionals in empowering children in vulnerable situations? Just a base question to any of the panel members. Any of this? Should we send that one to Anna? Well, I guess it's important to talk about uh, dialogue between children and and adults. Uh, we have, uh, for example, published uh, guidebooks about how to promote uh, the participation of, of uh, young people in alternative care through dialogue and through mutual uh, conversation between uh, adults and, and children. Mm -hmm. So, so I think it's crucial that we make sure that uh, children know their rights and, and we as adults, we talk about the rights. And Leah, do you want to add your perspective on that as well? Um, yes, I would like to add that uh, 
uh, well, it's similar to the open dialogue, but when children get placed in different homes and or or families or group homes, if they would get more, way more information of the technical parts or the logistic, the, like the, the more of the like, information about uh, how much they are, they are getting paid for, how, how much actually is being spent on different things, being for them to be more involved in their situation uh, and have more information will also lead them to ask more questions. If they don't know what they have or what they have the right to, and um, logistically speaking, and uh, in different placements and homes, they won't ask, and they won't definitely won't ask for more, um, or what they should have or deserve to. Um, so definitely keep them in the loop in all the different um, uh, changes and things. Super, uh, super important perspective with the right information and to be to have good knowledge about all the different details in your placement. Thank you, Ria. Yeah, so thank you so much, guys, for just a super inspiring discussion panel. Thank you all so much, and thank you, Tuva, for moderating. And um, yes, uh, the panel for today is closed, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And. And talking to you all, um, uh, just last remarks for tomorrow's day, because you'll also bring many more ideas for tomorrow. So see you all tomorrow. The conference will be held at 9 a.m. Uh, here in the conference room and also online. So do check the same link and stay tuned and see you all tomorrow. And to all of the participants here on the stage, we would welcome you to exit uh, the halls in an orderly fashion and keep well and stay safe. <laughs>